Can I invite you, please, if you are able, to stand for the reading of the scripture. This is God's holy word, so I would invite you to stand. The scripture is in your bulletin. It will be on the screen as well. It's from John chapter 18, verses 15 through 18, and 25 through 27. And we're reading from the NIV. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You are not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. As Simon Peter stood warming himself, he was asked, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. We're going to be dealing with something rather intense today as we continue our journey through the Gospel of John because we've come to a very intense passage. And as I read through this, and as I've read and prayed over this this week, I've thought a lot about the evil one. And the interesting thing about Satan is that he's not creative at all. He doesn't have a creative bone in his body. He can't create anything. All that he can do is distort and pervert and twist good things that God has given us. He doesn't create anything, but he'll try to distort it and pervert it. And I'll give you a perfect example of this. So l- let me ask a question. Has anyone here ever felt guilty about anything? <laughs> Rick didn't put his hand up. <laughs> about everything. About everything. <laughs> Everyone, I'm sure. You felt guilty about something. And if you don't, for you men, you have wives who will tell you. <laughs> if that's not here for this service today, so I can say that. But, but and is, tell me something, is guilt a good thing or a bad thing? I said that, asked that question on the bridge, and there was dead silence, and everyone's eyes were darting around, and you could see they were thinking, I, I want to give the right answer. What's the right answer? I'm not sure what the right answer here. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Not both. Guilt is good. Guilt is God-given. You know the only. You know who are the only people in the world who never feel guilt. What what are they called? Psychopaths. Exactly. The only people who never feel guilt are psychopaths. Guilt is a God-given emotion. It is a conscience that God has given to us. There are times when you and I should feel guilty. If you cheat on your spouse, I'm sorry. You should feel guilty about that. If you drive drunk, you should feel guilty about that. If you cheat on your income tax, there's no way around it. You should feel guilty about that. It's a God-given emotion. 
But Satan takes that God-given emotion that is healthy, that is right, that is good, and he twists it, and he perverts it, and he distorts it. And you know what he tur- turns it into? He takes that good thing, guilt, and he turns it into shame. Shame. Do you know what the difference is between guilt and shame? There is an ocean of difference between these two things. Guilt says, I have done something wrong. I've done something bad. I've done something I shouldn't have. Shame, on the other hand, says, I haven't done something wrong. I am something wrong. I am something bad. I am something perverted or twisted. And that's what Satan wants us to believe. And I'm speaking on this today because I encounter people every day in my ministry, and whether you know it or not, you you walk out this door... You walk 50 meters, you will pass someone, I guarantee it, who whether you know it or not, is wrestling with shame. It's one of the devil's most effective tools. He doesn't create it, but he takes guilt and he twists it. And, he, and, we, and, and instead of God saying to us, you've done something bad, you've done something rotten, Satan says, you are something bad. You are something rotten. And these, this emotion of shame is as old as humanity is. And in fact, there's a wonderful example of it, wonderful or terrible example of it in the scriptures. There's two people that I want to talk about, two of, 12, two of the 12 disciples And I want you to tell me who these two people are. I'm going to contrast them. In many ways, they were quite different. One was a Galilean, and the other a Judean. One of them was a poorly educated fisherman. The other, very well educated. The one was quite extroverted, enjoyed talking, the other was introverted. The one was quite impulsive, the other was very contemplative. The one could be very eloquent on occasion, the other was much more comfortable with numbers than with speeches. Who am I talking about? Who was the Galilean? Peter. Peter. Who was the other person, the Judean? Jude is very good. In the uh, bridge, the first thing they guessed was Matthew. But it's Judas. Very different people. But they also had a lot in common. Think about these two people. You have Matthew. What an amazing experience he had with Jesus during those three years. The things that he did. He walked on water. Remember when, G, when, he, when he went to see Jesus out of the boat? He witnessed the transfiguration when he went up on the mountain with Jesus and Jesus became as white as lightning and his, his clothes glistened. He caught a fish with a coin in its mouth when they were paying the temple tax. He had talked about him being impulsive. When Jesus was, was arrested, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, he cut off the ear of the high priest's servant in an act of impulsiveness. And of course, you remember when Jesus was talking to them and he said, who do men say that I am? And then he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then we have Judas. And scholars believe that Judas was the most educated of all Jesus' disciples. He was the only one 
with whom Jesus could talk and expect an understanding on the same intellectual level. And Jesus, as some have suggested, probably had more conversation, more communication, more confiding in Judas than any other disciple. And at the Last Supper, it was Judas who was given the seat of high honor next to Jesus. They were really standouts among the 12 disciples. And they had one other thing in common, Peter and Judas. They both messed up terribly. They both betrayed Jesus. The first with Peter. Rick read the story just a few minutes ago. Jesus was arrested, and Peter is following at a safe distance. And Jesus is inside the house of Caiaphas for his first trial, and Peter is outside, and they're gathered around a fire trying to keep warm. And three times, three times, Peter denies being a follower of Jesus. He betrayed him three times. And you know the story of Judas. You know how he went to the chief priests and the Pharisees. And he said, for 30 gold coins, or 30 pieces of silver, I will turn him over to you at a time and a place when you'll be able to arrest him. And so he went to the Garden of Gethsemane when he knew Jesus would be there. He betrayed him with a kiss and Jesus was arrested. He betrayed his Lord. Peter and Judas both betrayed him. But why is it then that the end of their stories are so different when they both did the same thing. Well, let's look at how it ends. We're, we're, we have to look at Matthew to see the rest of the story here. In Matthew chapter 26, the very end of the chapter, verse 75, Peter has just denied Jesus three times, and then Matthew says... Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Judas, on the other hand, we're told at the very beginning of the next chapter, 27, beginning at verse 3, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said. I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. You see the difference here. Peter was impulsive. Peter was arrogant. He thought that he would never betray Jesus. Remember, Jesus had warned him. Jesus had said to him three times before this night is over, you're going to disown me. And what did Peter say? Never. You might be right about most things, Lord, but this is one thing you're wrong about. I will never disown you. Even if I have to die, I will never disown you. He was arrogant. He was impulsive. And then when he did deny Jesus, he was broken. He realized that he could not live the life that he wanted to in his own strength. And that's exactly the point that God wants each one of us to reach. A point of brokenness. A point where we say, Lord, I've tried my best. I've really did everything I could and I just can't live this life that you want me to. And when we reach that point, when Peter reached that point, he, God says, good. And now 
That is why I sent my Holy Spirit. I know you can't do it. But guess what? I can. And I will come into you and I will do in you and through you and for you what you cannot do for yourselves. Peter was broken, feeling guilty. And that's exactly what God wanted. But with Judas, Satan took the healthy guilt that he would normally have been feeling and he twisted it into shame. And Judas felt that the only hope that he had was in making everything right. And so he went to, he went to the, the Pharisees and the chief priests and he said, I was wrong, I shouldn't have done this. I betrayed a sinless man, he was innocent. And they dismissed him, said it's nothing to do with us. The only hope, he thought, was in making things right. And when he couldn't, he despaired. He felt absolute shame. And he went out and hanged himself. You see, Peter's guilt was good. He was broken. And God was able to pour himself into him. But Judas felt shame. He felt despair. Peter said, I have done a terrible thing. I have done something I shouldn't have. Judas said, I am a terrible person. I am something awful. I'm bad. I'm evil. And that's what Satan wants you to feel. And there are people all around us today, some of you here today, have gotten caught up in shame. And you've listened to the lies of the evil one. And you've despaired because you don't know. If, 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 you do, if you've done something wrong, the forgiveness is possible. But when you are something wrong, what do you do? What's there left for you? And that's how Judas felt. And my friends, in our lives, and you know this, there are things that we do sometimes that can never be taken back. There are words spoken that we can never unspeak. There are people we hurt that we can never unhurt. If you're driving over the legal drinking limit and you ram into a car and kill, the, kill a mother and her child, you can say, our home, uh, you can say I'm sorry until the cows come home. It'll never bring the mother and child back. But the question is, what do you do with it? Where does that leave you? With Peter, it left him broken. And God was able to offer healing to him. With Judas, he felt the shame. He felt that he, there was something wrong with him. And nothing could ever put it right. And that's what Satan wants you to believe. But I'm here to tell you today that God does not make mistakes. You are not a mistake. You are not bad. You are not evil. You are created in the image of God. And as a creature created in God's image, you are just as God wants you to be in your nature. It doesn't mean we're not sinners. It doesn't mean we don't have a sin nature. We know that we do things, but the things that we do do not define us and make us who we are. Who we are is creatures in God's image. What we've done makes us sinners in need of forgiveness. 
And sometimes I watch these police shows and you'll hear a detective arresting someone who's done something terrible. And uh, he'll say, a piece, he's a piece of scum or he's a piece of garbage or he's a piece of trash. And even on a TV show, I cringe because they've just called someone created in God's image a piece of trash. God doesn't make trash. And the things we do do not define us. Satan will tell us that they do. Satan will tell us that we're wrong, that we're distorted, that we're we're bad, we're twisted, we're perverted. And that is the lie of the evil one. One of the greatest evangelists of the 19th century was a Scottish man named Brownlow North. And like most of us, he had done secret things in his life that he didn't want everyone to know about. And one day he was getting up before a huge auditorium, thousands of people. And just before he was to go up to preach, a note was handed to him. And the author of the note recounted a shameful incident from his youth. And he went on to say, if you dare to get up in that pulpit and preach, so help me God, I will stand up and denounce you and tell the entire congregation what you did. Brownlow North took the letter. He prayed over it for a few minutes. He then got up in the pulpit and he read it word for word. He then closed it and folded it. And looking out over the congregation, the first thing he said was that every word in that letter was true. And then he went on to talk about how Christ had forgiven him, healed him, and given him a brand new start. He took what could have been a shameful situation and turned it into something that was beautiful and healing. You know what? People around us out in the city need to know that God forgives that God heals. They don't need more perfect people. There's enough people in the church already who think they're perfect. What they need are people who will say, I was broken, I was knocked down, I was empty, and Jesus came and forgave me and healed me and filled me. That's the message of the gospel. That's the message that people need to hear. And some of you here this morning or some of the people that you're going to encounter, you've been caught up in this shame, these lies of the evil one. And God wants you today, now, to let it go. Now you need to know too, and hear me on this, that for some of you, if the shameful feelings that you have go deep enough, and if they started young enough when you were a child, you may need some help in letting that shame go. And we have connections at First Baptist with counselors all over the region. And we will connect you with a counselor who can help you move through those feelings of shame. If cost is an issue, we will cover the cost for you. Because God does not want you living your life in shame. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. That's what he wants for you. He doesn't want you hanging your head as though you are something to be sneered at. He wants you embracing the life that he offers you. And if you need some help 
embracing that life, we will do whatever it takes. We will walk alongside you to give you that. But this could be the start of a new day for you when we truly discover what it means that Christ forgives.